From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. This evening, I want to talk a few minutes about uh, hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism basically happens when there is uh, excessive thyroid hormone in the circulation and the clinical manifestations associated with this uh, condition are enormous just like uh, hypothyroidism it affects almost every organ in human body you see in primary hyperthyroidism there is so much from the gland so that there is a reverse inhibition of the TSH so there is a serum uh, TSH is suppressed in primary hyperthyroidism. Now, most common cause, the most common cause of hyperthyroidism is toxic diffuse goiter, that is Graves' disease. That's a very important point. It's an autoimmune disorder caused by immunoglobulin G, IgG antibodies. They bind to TSH receptors and they initiate enormous production and release of thyroid hormone from thyroid gland. So that is Graves disease. There are other causes for hyperthyroidism like toxic linoma, toxic multinodular goiter known as plumber disease and uh, there is also subacute thyroiditis and silent thyroiditis. I mean when there is like lymphocytic infiltration uh, causing it and there is postpartum thyroiditis, there is drug induced hyperthyroidism. Uh, especially amiodarone. So the, the causes are enorm enormous, but the most common cause is uh, Graves' disease. And uh, most common, as I said, in primary hyperthyroidism, TSH is suppressed. In secondary hyperthyroidism, the TSH is increased. Now let us see the symptoms and signs. Most often, they present with nervousness, tremor in their hands, and uh, the heart palpitations and uh, weight loss because of increased metabolism, dyspnea and exertion, and fatigue and weakness, and they feel difficult to concentrate, and they will also have heat intolerance. The gastrointestinal motility increases, so they will have diarrhea and frequent bowel movements. If you examine them, you will see a rapid pulse, and elevated blood pressure, like the systolic pressure goes up, and uh, it goes to a greater extent and the uh, diastolic pressure will be like this. So the systolic pressure goes up and uh, there will be a wide pulse pressure in these patients and many of them will have exophthalmos, especially patients with the Graves' disease with those big eyes and uh, muscle weakness and sudden paralysis. They will also have lower extremity myxedema, uh, the, the so-called pre-tibial myxedema. And heart problems are also common. They will have atrial fibrillation. That's very, very important point, folks. Atrial fibrillation is a very common thing in these patients. And I will talk about that in a moment. But the most common things you see in physical examination, they are tremor, anxiety, heat intoleration. Now, there are other causes, as I said, like subacute thyroiditis. In these patients, the symptoms and signs will be like uh, transient. They can also have fever. They can also have neck uh, tenderness. The other thing is postpartum thyroiditis. This postpartum thyroiditis, as the name suggests, happens after the delivery. And uh, postpartum thyroiditis, it's, uh, it can cause all symptoms, you see, in uh, classical hyperthyroidism. Okay, so that's very important. Now let me make a few comments about uh, the cardiac manifestations of hyperthyroidism. These patients will have palpitations, dyspnea, and even atypical chest pain. And cardiac arrhythmias are common, especially atrial premature contractions and atrial fibrillation. Now let me tell you one term, apathetic hyperthyroidism 
in the disease in the elderly female or male in atrial fibrillation may be the only manifestation of thyrotoxicosis. So a patient may come to you, an elderly patient with atrial fibrillation, that may be the only manifestation and if you check their thyroid status, they will have hyperthyroidism. So when atrial fibrillation is the only manifestation of thyrotoxicosis, we call it apathetic hyperthyroidism. That's a very important point, folks, because 10 to 20 percent of patients with atrial fibrillation are thyrotoxic. So you need to test. If you, whenever you, a patient comes with atrial fibrillation, you should always check their thyroid status. Also, these patients can develop a thromboembolism because, you see, atrial fibrillation itself is a risk factor, just like uh, atrial fibrillation coming from any other cause. Atrial fibrillation can cause thromboembolism. And uh, these patients can also have atrial flutter. And, uh, some, uh, but eight ventricular arrhythmias usually they are rare in thyrotoxicosis unless they have some other cardiac problem going on. These patients uh, may not have a, a good heat tolerance because of this. And many times the atrial fibrillation can lead to heart failure because you see the atria are failing and there, there may be rapid ventricular response and uh, the, when the ATL fa fail to completely uh, fill the ventricles heart failure starts and many times these patients develop uh, angina because of that uh, increased demands uh, are not met by the heart so anywhere from atrial fibrillation chest pain, palpitations, all of this can happen uh, with uh, thyrotoxicosis. So remember these points, folks, because there are many, many questions. Even myocardial infarction can be precipitated by thyrotoxicosis. And hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, you know, they can also cause behavioral changes. Remember, when we talked about hypothyroidism, we talked about uh, myxedema madness. In the same way, hyperthyroidism can cause anxiety and uh, tremor and behavioral changes. And uh, these patients will have tachycardia. That is the cause for the palpitations. Now, what about the labs? A few words about laboratory diagnosis. Now, if it is primary hyperthyroidism, so much thyroid is produced by the thyroid gland, so there is the inhibition of uh, TSH. So TSH levels are decreased in primary hyperthyroidism with uh, increase in uh, T4 level. In secondary hyperthyroidism, both TSH and uh, free T4 levels are increased. Now you can also check for other things like thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins because there are many autoimmune diseases that can cause hyperthyroidism. So once you identify hyperthyroidism, you need to do radionuclide uptake and the scanning of the thyroid gland, preferably with uh, iodine-123, because you need to see what exactly is the cause of hyperthyroidism, whether it is a Graves disease, which is uh, an autonom or a, a, a nodule or a thyroiditis. So you need to pinpoint what exactly is the cause. And uh, when you scan the Graves' disease, you see Graves' disease is diffuse goiter, so there will be increased activity, there will be diffuse hyperactivity. But in the nodules, you will see hyperactivity surrounded by hypoactivity. So that's an important point. And in a subacute thyroiditis, the uptake, the radio iodine uptake is decreased overall. So in Graves' disease, it is high, it diffuse. In nodules, it is uh, hyperactive, surrounded by hypoactive, whereas in subacute thyroiditis, it is decreased. Now, the other points most important are uh, in Graves' disease, especially thyroid storm can happen. In fact, any thyroid in any hyperthyroidism can result in a thyroid storm, which is characterized by confusion, fever, restlessness, and uh, sometimes even the psychotic changes. And these patients, if you examine them, you will see tachycardia, 
and uh, elevated blood pressure and fever and they develop uh, cardiac dysrhythmias very very frequently and the patients will uh, have other signs of uh, uh, high output heart failure because as you remember uh, I said atrial fibrillation can happen and also they might have a uh, chest pain and uh, cardiac and uh, cerebral ischemia because of decreased uh, uh, circulation to the brain and to the heart. So thyroid storm is a medical emergency and you need to treat it immediately folks. Now treatment. Treatment radioactive iodine that is the treatment of choice for Graves' disease if in adults, in all adults patients uh, provided the woman are not pregnant. So radioactive iodine is the treatment of choice for Graves' disease in adult patients who are not pregnant. In pregnant patients you should not use radioactive iodine and also for six months after you do the treatment you should ensure the birth control. So radioactive iodine should not be used also in pregnant women and also in a breastfeeding woman. Now there is a concern about in a Graves disease can we use for ophthalmopathy uh, we should not use radioactive iodine ophthalmopathy due to Graves disease that's why many physicians start them on oral therapy and then change to radioactive iodine therapy. So those are the very very important points. Radioactive iodine therapy. Then pharmacotherapy. There are antithyroid drugs. They are very very well tolerated. What they basically do is they block the production and release of thyroid hormone in patients with Graves disease. And these drugs they basically block that uh, organification of iodine. The very iodine the first step. Thank you. So they stop the organification of iodine, they also stop the conversion of T4 to T3. And the propyl thioracil, it is given in 2 to 3 doses. There are methamazole and carbamazole, and they are given as a, a single dose. Now, propyl thioracil can be used during pregnancy, that's an important point. Propyl thioracil, P and P. It can be used during pregnancy and the most serious side effects of propyl thioracil is a granulocytosis. Antithyroid drugs are especially useful in adolescents in whom Graves' disease may go into spontaneous remissions after like uh, 6 to 18 months of therapy. So antithyroid medications, you need to remember those points because they are very very good in uh, stopping the symptoms of uh, this problem and beta blockers whenever there is tachycardia you can add beta blockers and when the goiter is big disfiguring attacking I mean approaching and invading other organs in that case you should actually refer these patients to surgery so radio uh, iodine therapy then antithyroid medications, then surgical therapy. Now, what about uh, thyroid storm? How do you treat it? Whenever you see a patient with thyroid storm, you need to treat them as a medical emergency because it has grave complications. Treatment should include administration of high doses of propyl thioracil. You need to give lots and lots of uh, propyl thioracil because you should quickly reduce the actions and the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. And also you should use high doses of beta blockers like uh, propranolol. Because propranolol basically it controls the tachycardia and it also prevents those uh, dangerous cardiac arrhythmias we see in these patients. And when you see, prop, uh, you should also give them hydrocortisone because many of these patients develop adrenal crisis. So, folks, those are the most important things about hyperthyroidism, a very, very common thing. So, hopefully, you get those points and uh, also visit our website if you have some time. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. 
For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.